All right, well, welcome everybody. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Aguillon. She grew up in southeastern Arizona and spent her childhood hiking, fishing, and camping. She obtained her BS and MS from the University of Arizona, where she studied Western bluebirds. She completed her PhD in 2021 at Cornell University and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in upstate New York, studying northern flickers. Recently, Stephanie moved to California for a postdoctoral position at Stanford University studying fish. So with that, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And I'm going to mute my microphone and turn off my video and turn it over to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which will be presentation that I have over here so I can see on my computer. I'm going to move the Zoom windows a little bit so I have them. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I do. I'll first start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my research. Um, I have some natural history about flickers in here as well as some of the work that I've been doing. So since I'm not in person, I thought I'd introduce myself. So my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm a biologist that works on birds, primarily on evolution. Um, these are lots of photos of me in different places that I've been just since I'm not there um, physically to, to be present. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my sort of path to becoming a scientist um, here at the beginning. So I grew up um, in southeastern Arizona, really close to the border with Mexico. Um, if you are an avid birder that travels around places to bird, you might be familiar with Sierra Vista um, because it's a, a birding mecca in a lot of ways. Um, I actually wasn't interested in birds as a kid, um, but I was interested in being outside. And that's because um, it's a very beautiful place to be outside. Um, lots of saguaro cacti, uh, the desert is beautiful, lots of um, amazing sunsets. There's also a lot of um, really wonderful animal life. Um, so lots of unique birds, uh, many unique mammals, um, lots of reptiles. Um, and so I spent a lot of my childhood just enjoying being outside. Um, and in particular camping and fishing and hiking. Um, and that's really what got me interested in, in studying biology. And so I moved from Sierra Vista um, to the University of Arizona to do my undergraduate degree. Um, and then, you know, I worked on Western bluebirds and did some, some research as an undergrad and then decided to go to grad school to get a PhD. Um, and I moved quite far across the country to Cornell um, where I worked on northern flickers, which is what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, I heard you got a lot of snow recently, and I am, am glad to not really be in the snow anymore. Um, I had lots of experience and time in the snow during my PhD, and I'm glad to now be in California. <laughs> um, but during my PhD, I got the chance to go to a lot of amazing places, um, both for research as well as for teaching, um, for conferences. Um, and it's been an amazing journey for me. And I, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to do so many amazing trips and travel. Um, and so I finished my PhD in 2021 um, and then moved across the country and am in here now um, in California at Stanford. Um, I'm at the stage basically in my academic career where I'm applying for faculty jobs um, and I'm sort of in a what's called a postdoctoral position, which is sort of a, anywhere from, you know, two to five years um, of sort of like temporary employment, basically, where I do science um, until I can find a permanent position somewhere. Um, and so I'm here at Stanford right now. I thought what I'd show you first before I tell you about some science is, is um, a fun natural history observation that I've gotten to um, do over the past weeks. So a hummingbird chose to nest on my porch um, starting in, I guess now that it's March, it must have been early February. So the hummingbirds here sort of start nesting as soon as um, the, the rain start in the winter. She laid two eggs and I got to observe her lay the eggs and incubate the eggs. 
And then just on Tuesday, she fledged her her two babies. And this is her feeding one of the babies um, outside of the nest, which is really cute. They're still around, but I think they're they're starting to move farther and farther away um, from the nest. But I did hear from my partner that she was inside the nest today, sort of cleaning it up a little bit. And with all of the rain that we've had here recently, I'm sort of wondering, also the babies chose to fledge on the windiest day where we had a lot of downed trees. I was very worried about them, but they're okay. Um, but she was in the nest basically um, moving things around. So I'm wondering if she's gonna be re-nesting, which is pretty exciting. Um, okay, so that's hummingbirds, but I'm going to tell you today about um, my research, but I thought you all um, and this crowd would enjoy sort of the natural history um, observations that I've been doing while I've been here in California. So I'm my research is really focused on color, so I'm really interested in coloration. And I think for folks that are really interested in being outside and observing nature, it's, I think, not a stretch for why that is. Um, there's so many amazing colors and patterns present in nature. And biologists have really been fascinated by color for a long time. And so this is an illustration of Darwin, for example, on the beagle observing a butterfly. And the reason naturalists have been interested in color is because it's one of these traits that you can sort of look at and characterize in a way that you can tell other people um, so you can look at this butterfly and say, oh, this butterfly is indigo blue on my, my color swatch book. Um, we obviously don't characterize color in this exact way anymore, um, but it's still one of these, these um, characteristics that's very easy to des describe and to explain to other people. So I'm really interested in color. The other thing that I'm really interested in is hybridization. And this is something that if you've thought about hybridization, you might have thought of this example where you have a horse and a donkey that hybridize to produce mules. You might know that mules are really hardy pack animals. And so if you're, you know, hiking down into the Grand Canyon, you want a mule, but that they can't produce any offspring. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is sort of the extent that you think about hybridization. Because, for example, if you if you Google search hybrid animal, these are the type of images that you get. These obviously not real animals um, that are hybrids. Um, but hybridization is actually really common in nature, and particularly so in birds. So I'm going to show you lots of images of hybrid individuals. And we know that these individuals are hybrids because of the way they look. So they have very interesting color patterns. They have um, different swatches of color on different parts of their body. And because of this, we can compare them to the more typical um, pure individuals and understand that they are hybrids. And in particular for what I'm going to tell you about today, um, this combination of hybridization and color can help us get at the um, genetic basis of some of these colors. And I'll sort of tell you just um, briefly sort of how this um, works basically. So if we zoom in on one of these individuals, this is a, a warbler. And the parents of this individual are the blue-winged warbler and the golden-winged warbler. And they produce this hybrid Lawrence's warbler. Um, these Lawrence's warblers are not super common. They're actually really, really rare because they're um, very early generation hybrids um, that don't occur very commonly. But when we do see these Lawrence's warblers, hopefully what you can see is it has this overall yellow coloration, and it gets this from the blue-winged warbler parent, but it also has this black eye line and this bib, and it gets those from the golden-winged warbler parent. And so hopefully this um, sort of connection between parents and the way this offspring looks gives you um, the sort of the intuition that these color patterns are due to genetic differences. And so this is the way that hybridization can help get at the genetic basis of color and sort of the motivation for a lot of my work. Now, I don't work in warblers, um, though there are some, some great biologists um, that are interested in hybridization and color that do work on warblers. But I work on the northern flicker. This is a really common woodpecker that's distributed across North America, and it comes in two, two forms. Um, the red shafted flicker, which is broadly distributed in the West. Um, this has these salmon, salmon colored wings. Um, and um, in, this is present where I am right now. 
And in the east, where you are right now, is the yellow shafted flicker. It has these really vibrant yellow wings. And these are interesting woodpeckers because you'll often see them on the ground. Um, and I'm going to show a brief video here because I think um, these birds are really fun. Um, you should still be able to see my screen, I think. If I can see what it's showing. Yes. OK, perfect. Um, I'm going to make this big and then press play. But so these woodpeckers are interesting because you often find them on the ground. So they eat ants. Um, and so you'll see them basically hopping around, walking around, and digging their face into the soil. When I capture these birds and have them in the hand, their beaks are often just covered and coated with mud and dried dirt um, because they do this very often. Um, so they primarily eat ants, so you won't see them on trees like other woodpeckers sort of looking for food um, in the bark. Um, so you mostly see them just walking around. So if you see a big bird on the ground that looks like a woodpecker, um, but is not in a tree doing typical woodpecker things, it's most likely a flicker. And in particular where you are, a yellow shafted flicker. Okay. But, let me go back to the presentation here. That doesn't mean that you won't see them in the trees. So they're woodpeckers, they nest in, in cavities. Um, they are what's called primary cavity nesters, which means they are the ones that, that actually build the cavities in the trees. Um, these are cavities that other birds and other mammals and other organisms then use later. Um, but flickers do use cavities in trees. They also will, will nest in nest boxes, though not as readily as other organisms. Um, and they have a lot of um, really fun and interesting behavioral displays um, that you will often see them doing. And I'll show you here a brief video as well. Um, other video. And these behavioral displays are ones that both males and females participate in. Um, and you'll see basically two individuals that look at each other, they point their heads up, sort of like um, up to the sky, and they do a little dance back and forth. Um, this is associated with um, a call, so they do what's called a, a wicca call. Um, these birds also, if they're in trees, you'll see that they sort of um, flare their wings and their tail feathers out um, and sort of display the color underneath a little bit as well but they also do these displays on the ground. Um, and so this is something that males do with other males, females do with other females, males do with females. And it's sort of a, both a territorial um, behavior as well as a, like associated with mating and, and getting ready to breed as well. So these are the sort of ways you will often see these birds either um, on the ground eating ants, um, up in their cavities, um, or doing these territorial displays. And what excites me particularly about flickers is that they also hybridize extensively. So we have this region in yellow here and this region in red on the map, but in orange, what I'm showing you is where the ranges of these two types of flickers um, overlap and where they produce hybrids. And so this is broadly in the Great Plains, sort of ranging from Northern Texas and following the Rockies up into Alaska. So there's a broad region where hybrids are present. And we know that these birds hybridize and we know that they've hybridized for a long time because of the way they look. So red shafted and yellow shafted flickers differ in a number of, of um, plumage patches. So think very clearly and based on their name um, and just looking at them, you'll understand that they differ in the color and the wing and the tail. That's the very obvious difference. Um, and it's very easy to see when they're in flight. But if you have a bird in the hand or um, in your scope or binoculars, and you look in and zoom in on the head and the face, there are a number of differences there as well. So in males, they have this um, black or red spot on the face called the malar stripe, and that differs between these two sus subspecies. One is red and one is black. They also differ in the color of the throat, gray versus tan, as well as a number of other traits as well, the color of the ear coverts, the color of the crown, yellow shafted flickers have a really broad red patch on the nape of their, their neck that red shafted flickers lack. And so they have a number of these traits that differ between them. 
And in the hybrid zone, you can see individuals that have a variety of different combinations of these traits. So hybrids can have different combinations of these six traits. They can have intermediate colors. So colors ranging from either end of the spectrum and everything in between, as well as the combination of all of these different traits. So just looking at an individual, you can often tell if it has some kind of hybrid ancestry. And to show you this sort of what this looks like in a, in a real individual here, instead of illustrations, you can sort of see this individual has orange colored wings. So they're not really the bright, vibrant yellow, but they're also not the, the salmon pink. There's this orangish color. This bird has a red mallard stripe, but it also has a red nuchal patch. Um, so it has this combination of different um, traits as well as sort of intermediate colors. And so this can be present both in particular individuals as well as sort of at the population wide. And this hybridization is one of the things that has really fascinated me um, and is what I focus my PhD on and is what I hope if I get a faculty job to have my lab focus on. And today I'm going to tell you about two, two stories um, in Flickers. So the first one is going to be focused on plumage coloration across the hybrid zone. And the second is going to be focused on getting at the genetic basis of plumage color in these birds. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about the hybrid zone. So the hybrid zone has a long history of study. And just to again, orient you on the map, it's this orange region here present in the middle of, of the continent. And the great thing about this hybrid zone having been studied for a long time is, is that we know a lot um, historically about what this hybrid zone looked like. So there have been collections that have been made of these birds and they live in museums. Um, and what we know is that as you go from west to east across the hybrid zone, you go from red shafted like coloration traits and in individuals through intermediate coloration traits over to yellow shafted like traits in the east. And so we know there's this gradation as you go from west to east. And for me, it was very exciting that these collections exist because they live in the museum where I did my PhD, the Cornell University Museum of Vertebrates. So this is a setup of some of these specimens for uh, an outreach event with the public. Um, because these coloration um, traits are, are so clear and vibrant and easy to observe, um, these, are great, these are great birds to do um, outreach with. And so, we have this, this historic collection from the mid-1950s at the museum. And for me, when I started my PhD, I saw this as a perfect opportunity to think about sampling along the same transect. So what I did for my PhD was sample these birds in the same area where they'd been sampled in the 1950s. And so we have now a historic and a contemporary collection. And this was all made possible because these birds hybridize in the Great Plains. And if you can sort of imagine the Great Plains, you probably don't immediately think about a lot of trees, and that's correct. Um, the only place that trees really exist in the Great Plains are, are along these river valleys, and because flickers rely on trees to nest, um, the only place you can really find them are along these river valleys. And so that means we can, we can collect along the same river valley, the Platte River, that was collected in the 1950s and sort of get at the same locations that these birds were collected before. And what I was really interested in understanding is how has the hybrid zone changed over the last 60 years? And because we know that these birds hybridize based on the color of their feathers, we can get at an understanding of how the hybrid zone has changed on the landscape just by looking at the color of, of flicker feathers. So we've conducted resampling across um, the same transect. So we have this historic sampling that already lived in the museum. And then we did some contemporary sampling that was both um, catching individuals and releasing them, as well as collecting individuals to also live in the museum um, for future um, scientists. And this was all done in collaboration with the curator of birds and mammals at the museum, Vanya Rower. So just wanna acknowledge that here. And my sort of broad hope is that, you know, in another 60 years, somebody will want to do another resampling here and that that will live in the museum as well. And that this will be a living, um, living source of, of information here. So with these birds, what I've done is describe um, a, what's called a hybrid index. All that means is a score that varies from zero to one, where zero indicates a pure yellow shafted flicker individual, and one indicates a pure red shafted flicker individual. And I've already described the traits that um, 
I was using. So these differences in the wing and tail color, the various differences on the head and the face. And so these in combination create a score of anywhere from zero to one. And when I do this, I'm going to describe um, these results in what's called a geographic climb. And I'm first going to walk you through how to read this kind of figure. So this is a geographic climb. Um, it's looking on the x-axis here um, at distance along a particular transect. And the y-axis is, is some sort of phenotypic trait. Um, you can think of this as the difference in the wing and the tail color here. And along this geographic line, on one end, you have one particular species. On the other end, you have the other particular species. And traits in the middle are where the hybrid zone is present. You have individuals of sort of intermediate coloration. And so you have this, this climb that grades from one species through intermediates over to the other species. And so that's the kind of data that I'm going to dis that I'm going to display here for this hybrid zone. So what I found is that in resampling this hybrid zone, the um, sort of center of the hybrid zone has actually moved west. So I'm going to show you the the climb here for the historic samples. So again, we grade from red shafted lichen in the west through intermediates over to yellow shafted lichen in the east. This is for the historic samples. But when we sampled contemporarily, what we found is that this has moved left along this plot, so moved west on the landscape. And this is for sort of the overall um, summary of all of the different phenotypic traits. Um, but this is also present in individual traits as well. So um, we see that um, in this overall trait, again, things have shifted left, but individual traits have shifted west as well. So both the crown, the nuchal patch, the shaft, um, which is the wing and the tail. So all of these things have shifted westward. And if we look at this on the map, this is a movement from um, in the mid-1950s, sort of being centered here, really close to the Nebraska-Colorado um, boundary, um, and shifted westward towards the Rocky Mountains. So the points one and two are getting into um, where the Rockies are present. Um, so this hybrid zone is really shifting um, very quickly towards the Rockies. And interestingly, this movement has likely occurred really rapidly in the last 30 to 40 years. So some work that was done in the 1980s showed that the hybrid zone was largely stable and hadn't moved. This is potentially the result of climate change. So we know in other hybrid zones that things have been shifting primarily northward is how we think of things. But this hybrid zone, given that it's um, uh, has an east-west um, boundary, um, has shifted west, um, which would be sort of a, a new way to think about hybrid zone movement due to climate change. But I think there's a broad potential that this is a climate-related shift. The alternative possibility is that this is the result of some sort of land management changes. So again, these birds um, are living along a river valley um, and there, there has been broad changes in how land has been managed in this region of, of the US. Um, and in particular, this so here's some aerial photographs where on the left is, is a comparison in the 30s um, and on the right is a comparison in the 80s. Um, and hopefully what you see is there's a lot more trees in this river valley. Um, and so it's possible that the fact that there are more trees has differentially affected the birds in the east from the birds in the west. Um, because the birds in the west are coming over the Rockies, perhaps it doesn't matter that there's more trees. They're already having a hard time getting into the hybrid zone. Whereas the birds in the east are don't have a big geographic barrier in between them and the Great Plains. And so perhaps having more trees here allows them more movement into the hybrid zone. Um, but that's sort of an, an area where I'm actively doing research and trying to understand what's going on. Um, but just to sort of summarize what we know so far, um, going back to this broader question, has the hybrid zone changed over the last 60 years? Um, we see, yes, that it, there has been movement, um, in fact, quite a lot of movement. Um, and this um, is shown both in this geographic Klein figure as well as on um, the map itself. You can sort of see how this has shifted. So this is telling you a little bit here about this first um, this first story here about um, plumage color in the hybrid zone. But what I'm going to tell you now is um, sort of using these um, hybrid individuals of different colors and combining this with genetics to understand the genetic basis of plumage color.
So the hybrid zone is a really great opportunity to think about the genetic basis of color. So I showed you the, the fact that hybrids have really interesting combinations of different colors and um, combos from red shafted and yellow shafted parents. They also have really mixed up genomes. So if we think about the genome just as this colored bar here where yellow indicates a region that um, is yellow shafted DNA and red indicates a region that's red shafted DNA, they have lots of different mixed up combinations in hybrids. And we can use this to our advantage because the phenotypes, the, the colors are all mixed up and the genomes, the genotypes are all mixed up. We can ask, for instance, if we want to understand the genetic basis of the red coloration of the wing and the tail, we can look in hybrids that have that red coloration and ask what region of their genome is the same, but different from other individuals. And so in this sort of toy example, we can see this region here at the top of this genome um, that's red in coloration is only present in, in those individuals and would be what's um, the region of interest in causing this coloration. So hybrids are this great opportunity because they have this mixed up genotype and mixed up um, coloration phenotypes. So the question for me here is, what is the genetic basis of color differences in these flickers? To do this, I've done um, genomic sampling. I'm gonna tell you about the methods here in just a single slide, but I'm happy to answer questions if there's interest in that. But what this entails is some sort of blood or tissue sampling. And so I've conducted here sampling from um, far away from the hybrid zone, as well as samples in the hybrid zone. Some sort of molecular lab work. Um, here I'm doing what's called whole genome sequencing. So getting um, sequencing data from the entire genome. And then, in fact, a lot of computer work is where I spend my time. Um, and this has resulted in 7.25 million markers. And I'll tell you what I mean by markers. So I'm just going to describe here what are markers of differentiation. So if we look at three individuals and we look at their DNA, we can see here a red shafted individual and two yellow shafted individuals. And as you look from left to right, you see lots of similarities, lots of similarities, and then one region that is different. This is what I'm calling here a marker. This is also called a single nucleotide polymorphism. This is a region of the genome that is different. And we can use these to sort of characterize what the landscape of the genome looks like in these birds. And I'm going to walk you through um, what the results from this type of, of analysis look like. And I'll do that first in a single chromosome, and then we'll look at the entire genome. So if we look at a single chromosome, we have a result that looks like this. And I'm going to walk you through this plot. As you go from left to right on the x-axis, this is position along the genome. In this case, I'm showing you just a single chromosome. So as you go from left to right, you're looking along chromosome 10 from left to right. The y-axis here is a measure of differentiation, where zero means a marker is completely identical, and one indicates a marker is completely different. The really only important part here is the higher up you go on this axis, the more different that region of the genome is between the two things you're comparing. In this case, comparing red shafted and yellow shafted individuals that are far away from the hybrid zone. So hopefully what you see when you look at this plot is as you go from left to right, there's very, very similar, very, very similar until you get to this region at the end that's very different. These kind of plots are often called Manhattan plots. And that's because you're looking sort of at what you can imagine as a city skyline, and you're looking for these skyscrapers that sort of pop up along, along this skyline. So these regions that are really, really different compared to the background. So this is just a single chromosome, but we can also look across the whole genome. And what we see is um, a pattern of low differentiation, but a number of these skyscrapers. So you can imagine there are 7.25 million points here. So there are lots of points that are down here close to the, the zero line. So the average across the genome is very, very low, which means that these birds are really, really genetically similar. But hopefully what you also see is a number of these skyscrapers that sort of pop up against the background. And this is just a comparison of these red shafted versus yellow shafted birds. But hopefully you remember that I introduced that hybrids have a lot of potential to sort of help um, untangle what's happening here. And when we add hybrids into this um, sort of analysis, what we find is multiple regions of the genome are associated with their coloration differences. 
So if we zoom in here just on the wing and the tail color, we can see results from um, this analysis. This is again another Manhattan plot, but this time the y-axis is a measure of strength of association between a particular genomic region and a particular coloration. In this case, the wing and the tail color. So the higher up you go on this um, plot, the more strongly that particular region of the genome is associated with a particular coloration trait. So hopefully what you see here is a number of these regions that are very strongly related to the wing and the tail color here. And so I've done this for, for lots of the, the different traits on the head and the face as well, but I'm not going to show that data just because it's not particularly exciting for a presentation. But what I will do is talk a little bit about the genes that are present um, in these regions. So there are actually many pigmentation genes, um, some related to melanin pigments. So these are pigments that create the browns and the grays and the blacks that we see in nature. So a number of genes that are related to melanins. There are also a number of genes related to carotenoids. So these are the pigments that create the bright reds and the oranges and the yellows that we see in birds in particular. So mammals don't have carotenoids, but we see these in birds and reptiles, um, fish, a number of genes related to carotenoids. Some of these genes have really clear um, potential roles in flickers. So this gene CYP2J19, for instance, is one of the only genes we know in birds that's related to this yellow to red coloration difference. Um, it basically changes a yellow carotenoid into a red carotenoid. And we see this in flickers um, associated with their wing and their tail color differences. And this makes a lot of sense just based on um, the fact that this is a yellow to red coloration difference. But what you might notice here is that there are a lot of melanin genes, and the question is, what's going on there? So if we look at the traits that these melanin genes are related to, in fact, they're largely carotenoid traits. So traits like the malar stripe, the stripe on the, the head and the face, um, the nuchal patch, which is this broad red patch on the nape of the neck, and the color of the wing and the tail, which again is this bright red versus bright yellow. But melanins and carotenoids are not really known to um, be influenced by the same processes in the body. So carotenoids have to be ingested. They're then biochemically processed, and then they're deposited. Whereas melanins are things that um, most vertebrates can just produce um, without any dietary inputs. So they have these very different processes, um, but we're finding them related to each other here um, in flickers, which is a really novel association. and. While I don't have answers for why this um, pattern exists, I'm gonna walk you through some potential hypotheses. So the first thing to know is that feathers are complicated structures. So there are a lot of steps going from the pigment that is in a feather out to the color that we see. There's a nanostructure in feathers, there's microstructures and macrostructures, there's the way the feathers are arranged on top of each other. So there's lots of different steps um, in between the pigment and the color that we see. And it's likely that genetics are involved in many parts of this, this process. And interestingly, when, well, one thing that I find interesting is that aberrant flickers can give us some clues about what's going on here. So I'm really interested in sightings of birds that are um, sort of atypical. And there's been a number of sightings of flickers that um, lack melanin in their feathers. So these are individuals that are either are leucistic um, or albinistic. Um, so albinos basically lack um, melanin completely in their body, whereas leucism, um, basically leucistic individuals lack melanins just in parts of their body. And so these are different aberrant flickers, and hopefully what you can see is that their bodies are just flush with carotenoids. So they have these red, these pink pigments, these yellow pigments sort of throughout their body. And if we zoom in on one of these individuals, so this individual here in the, the center, and this is a sighting that really is what got me excited about these birds, because um, this happened early during my PhD um, and was in, in the east um, where I was. So this is a yellow shafted flicker. It's a male, um, which would usually look like this um, illustration here on the right. Um, but what you can see, hopefully, is this malar stripe that I pointed out a few times is typically black in yellow shafted flickers. But in this aberrant individual that lacks melanin, it still has a red patch there, um, which is more like the red shafted flicker. So what these birds are doing with this patch in particular is they have an already present red malar stripe, and they're instead just 
layering black pigments on top of that to make it look black, um, but the red pigments are still there. So perhaps this relationship um, that I'm finding between these melanin genes and these carotenoid traits is less about what's happening with the carotenoids than, themselves and more about what's happening with the melanins and where these birds are choosing to deposit these pigments on their body. Um, and these pigments are sort of perhaps blocking other colors that are already present, um, but we sort of can't see unless we have these aberrant individuals that lack these pigments altogether. So just to sort of round back out to this question of what is the gen genetic basis of color in these birds. Um, so these birds are really, really genetically similar. There's just a few regions in their genome where they're really different, and these tend to be related to coloration differences. And within these regions, there's a number of pigmentation genes that um, some of them have really clear hypotheses um, for what they're doing, um, and others we're sort of still trying to work out what exactly is going on. So to summarize what I've told you today, um, told you a little bit about plumage coloration across the hybrizona flickers, and that using this coloration, we've been able to see that the flicker hybrid zone has moved west over the past 60 years, um, and this is um, shifted towards the Rocky Mountains. I've then told you a little bit, bit about using these hybrid flickers to sort of get at the genetic basis of color. And I've told you some work that I've been doing using um, genomic sequencing to understand what's happening in the genome. These birds are really, really genetically similar. Um, in fact, out of these 7.25 million markers that differ across the genome, only about 700 of them are completely always different um, between red shafted and yellow shafted flickers. So 700 out of over 7 million is a really small number. So these birds are really, really similar in the genome. But the regions that they do differ are the ones that create their coloration differences. So I'm continuing to work on flickers, and I don't have, um, you know, answers for everything um, about, you know, there's a lot more questions that I've created from the work that I've done than there are answers, but I'm really, really excited to continue exploring cool biology and flickers. Um, one of the things that I'm currently working on is thinking about migration. So this is showing the distribution of flickers across the annual cycle in North America. So hopefully what you see as this animation goes across the year is that these birds migrate. So they move from more southerly latitudes up to breed into Canada and the northern parts of the U.S. And then in the winter, they sort of come back down um, into the southern parts of the U.S. And if I map on here the, the typical flyways of birds in North America, you can see there's some particular flyways in the west, some particular flyways in the east. And if I color these based on um, the two types of flickers, red shafted or yellow shafted, hopefully you see that um, these sort of are, this, the flickers are likely doing different things. But the hybrid zone exists right in the middle of this. And it's possible that hybrids migrate poorly. And so that's something I'm interested in exploring. What I'm doing right now is um, piloting the use of, of basically GPS trackers, um, though they're actually cell, cell, cellular trackers um, on birds here in California. We basically capture birds um, at, at the banding station. We put on these cellular trackers. Um, we don't have to recapture the bird. These ping off of local cell towers when the bird is nearby and basically triangulates their location. Um, this lets me open an app to see where these birds are. Um, this is actually um, the movement of these trackers being delivered to me um, in the Bay Area. So they were driven um, across the country and then got on a plane and, and um, then pinged again in California. Um, so that was fun when they were delivered to actually see that they're, they're working. So this is something I'm, I'm deploying right now in California and birds that are sort of wintering here. Um, and then I'm hoping that given it, it works well is something I'm going to be doing in the Great Plains as well. Um, okay, so that's just to give you an idea of some of the other cool, cool biology that um, flickers have. Um, just um, to put here, lots of funding su and support um, and advising um, and lots of help from co-authors. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll go ahead and stop sharing so that I can see the Zoom window.